Welcome to the Heart of Health Equity. My name is Ashley Rogers. I'm the host of the show. And today I have an amazing guest, uh, Yolo Akili Robinson, who is not only the founder and executive director of Bean, he's also an author of many, many amazing books. Welcome, Yolo. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here, Ashley. I'm excited to have a conversation with you. And I've always appreciated your support of not just health equity broadly, but also specifically all, all your amazing support for Bean as well. So Excited to be here. Um, I'm Yolo Keely Robinson, and um, as Ashley shared, I'm the executive director and founder of BEAM, the Black Emotional Mental Health Collective. BEAM is a national training, movement building, and grant making organization dedicated to the healing, wellness, and liberation of Black folks. And so I'm excited to talk to you today. Okay, Yolo, like I have to say that you are probably the most humblest person that I know. I'm just going to like start off because this is like the freshest news that I just got wind of. Just yesterday, I believe, Megan the Stallion came out with her website uh, called Bad Bitches Have Bad Days com that is basically talking about mental health, especially folks in mental health. And Beam was listed as one of those organizations. Like, can we talk about that? Like, that's such a big deal. I like, I'm just really proud. And, like, let's talk. How are you feeling? Yeah, I mean, I'm super excited. Um, of course, I'm a big fan of Megan Thee Stallion. I know the song that she's referencing that, that website is built around is a song she has on her album called Anxiety. And I remember when I first heard it, it's really her sharing about, you know, as she said, bad bitches have bad days too. Like, you know, she can still be an amazing, powerful performer, powerful woman, artist, and still have difficult days and talked about struggling with anxiety, struggling with the loss of her mother, struggling with like, you know, trust and thinking about therapy and being scared and concerned about therapy, right? So the website is all built around that song, but it's connected to other resources like Bean, which was really amazing to me because I listen to a lot of Megan Thee Stallion. I find a lot of her work really motivating, you know, like hip hop kind of gets me going when I need to kind of be in my hustle and grind mode. And so I really love uh, Megan as one of my favorite artists. And so that just meant a lot to me to see her do that. But um, yeah, I love that what she's doing with her platform is like lifting that up, getting people connected to resources and organizations they might not know about. So it was super dope, super exciting, unexpected, <laughs> but really nice. Look, Yellow, I've known you for years. When you become even bigger than you are, don't forget the little people. I'm mean, like, Yellow, you remember me? Ashley. Oh, Ashley. don't even try it. <laughs> Ashley, I always appreciate like how you, you know, found us when we were much smaller and really kind of it just was a champion for our work and you've been a champion for us ever since and so i appreciate all the work that you do for us not only for us but i know for a lot so many other organizations that i'm sure can say the exact same because they like actually brought us in and we're grateful and like and so i just want to say that to you too thank you for all your advocacy your education your talking to the big dogs and bringing them down to the community grounds folks you know it's really appreciated and it's helping us um it's helping us make this possible you know so thank you uh, I mean, that that means a lot. Thank you. I try to, like, when you're in spaces, you have to be able to, you know, share the wealth with everyone, especially when these big companies have all these coins, and they don't realize that the ones who are actually on the ground are the ones who are doing all the work, and they should be getting paid their worth. And I, I hopefully I can help that with you and so many other organizations as we move forward. So thank you for that. We ask all of our guests this. What does health equity mean to you? When I think about getting to health equity, I just think about structural uh, transformation and also sometimes abolishing certain systems or certain framings of thinking, right? I think about also like, you know, moving towards a culture that understands that depression and anxiety, like, you know, there's a stigmatizing language of trauma responses, but they are in many ways, um, a lot of therapists say adaptive responses are, you know, so we might, might even say, they are the outcome of what happens to our systems when they are under duress, right? So like, if I'm experiencing depression or grief after a loss, that is my, that, that makes sense that my spirit, my body is having that experience, right? If I'm experiencing heightened anxiety in a community where, you know, um, the threat of violence is ever present, that anxiety is adaptive. It's, it's my nervous system trying to get, make sure I'm safe and protect me, right? And so when we start thinking about some of those things in that way, we start to think about like how we heal them differently as opposed to being shame or you have anxiety. Well, I have anxiety because maybe I grew up in an environment where having that anxiety kept me safe. Being, being hypervigilant kept me safe. And so as opposed to shaming it, going to a place like, how did I learn this? Okay, this was a coping strategy, a, a survival strategy. Now it's in my body, it's in my system. How do I now regulate it differently? How do I relate to it differently? What does that look like? So I think we have a lot of reframing to do away from the shame pathology based model to a model of care, to a model of humanity. 
why did you start Beam? And what was, what was the premise? Because I know it was after an amazing person that inspired you, but why did you start Beam? You know, I always knew that I wanted to make an organization. I just didn't know what it was going to be for so long. I always kind of had that inkling. And my previous work, you know, in HIV and other forms of wellness and mental health, domestic violence, had really equipped me with a lot of insight in terms of how people were talking about mental health or not talking about mental health or not talking about wellness. From seeing things, so many things from that vantage point, I recognized that there was not, in my opinion, an institution that was holding space for us to really um, get skills from a healing framework, from particularly from a healing justice framework. And so it was just kind of like me thinking like, what is missing here? What is the gap? What is the, what is the disconnect? And the disconnect that I started to see was when it came to um, support for our communities, a lot of the focus was on, you know, as, as a, mental health was emerging as the topic of the day, if that makes sense. A lot of the focus was on therapists. But the reality is we have a store of therapist shortage in this country, right? Like, you know, and I, I know there's some people who contend with that. They're like, oh, we don't have a therapist shortage. But I would actually argue that we do have a lack of culturally competent therapists in this country. And so with that being the reality, um, who is doing the, the vast amount of the care in our communities? Who are the real first responders? And in most of our communities, they're not always social workers. They're not always therapists or psychiatrists because of, they're not available to us. They're often teachers, coaches, uh, reverends and pastors. They are like, you know, big mamas and cousins, community activists or community leaders. And so my thought was, I saw these folks doing that immediate crisis support, like in salons and barbershops but not always having as much skills as they could have to do it and navigate them differently, right? To have more skills to be able to reframe conversations around mental health in ways to help give people to care. Um, another, have giving them tools to really understand the landscape of how, what's happening in the community, what's available in their community, and also how to get them to the care they need, right? So we decided like, how do we focus? Let's focus on the barbers, the teachers, the coaches, the parents, let's give them skills, let's train them. And training them with understanding of their boundaries. We're not training them to be therapists. We're training them to be um, community members who have the skills to listen, validate, support, get people into care, discern when someone is in a broader psychological um, distress that needs a different kinds of intervention. That's what we're giving them, right? And understanding that that is shifting the landscape of the community. And we're putting a lot on barbers and beauticians and community workers, but not giving them the tools to do it even better. And so it's great that you have this training. And I personally have taken one of your training. It was amazing. And it changed my whole perspective of how I think about mental health. Like I've always been a big mental kid, but I also was able to heal in that training. Like, I don't think you realize the work that you're doing is um, touching so many lives. And even though, and I, and I highly recommend those who are watching this, who are interested in thinking and talking about mental health and working in these spaces to take his training because it has made me a better human. It has made me a better public health practitioner. It's made me a better um, friend. It's made me a better, um, like community activist in a way, right? Because I understand, I understand mental health in a different, like you show, you, you, your trainings show a different level of how you should look at mental health and all the people who that it touches and how it affects us personally and how it affects our big mom and how it affects our moms and all these things. And like what it does for the community overall, that we're not talking about it in such a culturally competent way for a long time. We have either not felt safe to talk about these things, not have resources or the acts and you're you're bridging that gap so thank you i mean to beam and, the, and your crew because y'all are all doing this amazing work for free at that right like you're not charging folks who are signing up online which is amazing and like can we talk about your grant making because you're like not only giving these things for free giving these trainings for free and these sort these resources but you're also providing grants to other organizations? Like, can we talk about the organization that you're funding across the country? Yeah, you know, I think um, it's important for us to know that like the healing justice or healing and wellness work can't begin and end with being. We have to be in collaboration with our partners across the country. And there are so many amazing organizations that we have the opportunity to not only partner with, but also just be in collaboration with, right? We have um, three different funds that we have right now, our Black Wellness Innovation Fund with Black Parent Support Fund. We also have recently our Black Birth Grants. Those are the kind of things we fund, right? Like, you know, like really funding innovative, thoughtful leadership and projects. Um, last one I'll mention is we have our Black Trans Women's Wellness Grants. There were some amazing Black trans women across the United States who are doing wellness and mental health spaces. And we were like, we need to fund them and have make sure they have resources. And so we have Darren Nishia, um, Duncan Boyd, who's in Alabama, 
who has a take center where she has been literally, you know, scraping together so the, the funds to have a therapist come and do a group with just, you know, queer and trans folks, right? And so we were like, how do we support you to have more money to do this so this can be consistent in an area and a state like Alabama, which isn't always supportive of Black, trans, and queer folks? Y'all do a lot in the intersectionality of Blackness and queerness. What type of work are y'all doing to reach the Black queer community? We are a Black organization that does not assume that everybody who's Black is heterosexual. And we're not used to organizations like that. We're used to organizations that when they say they're Black, there is no real consideration to like queer and trans folks. Maybe there's a program off to the side, but we like, no, we integrate into everything that we do and understanding that there are queer folks and trans folks and people living with mental conditions and people who are disabled in the room. Black people are not monolithic. And so for us, it's not about, you know, being Black or queer. It's about integrating into all of our work and understanding of the diversity and multitudes of Black folks. So that if wherever you are in your identity, your spectrum, wherever you are, you come and you see some reflection of yourself or some acknowledgement of yourself as legitimate to be there, right? And that's really, I think, really important for all Black institutions to be thinking about. It changes the way you do work. It changes the way things happen. But it makes sure that we don't assume heterosexuality and erase folks, you know? And so I just want to hold that, like, we've always been here, you know what I mean? Um, what has not always been here has been the intense transphobia and homophobia which is often used as a scapegoat to avoid or evade or deny broader societal issues or, you know, or problems that um, politicians or different people are facing, right? So just naming that. Um, as far as like support, we definitely, we have um, a lot of virtual uh, healing circles. Uh, one of them is called Heart Space, and we've done them around like, you know, coming out and the conversation about coming out. Or, or what we call, some people call coming in, like inviting someone into your um, emotional life, like inviting them into your truth, you know? understanding that for folks who are black and brown that process is very delicate and you know sometimes it's ongoing and sometimes you have to be really selective and thoughtful about that for your safety you know like for our folks in rural communities and not just rural communities you could be in la anywhere homophobia and transphobia are not just you know in the south or in you know rural communities but we always have to be thoughtful because like sometimes our family members um have been indoctrinated to fear and you know, and may not be able to get to a place to honor, to honor who we are, and that's a real thing. So many people are contending with, and so like um, practicing safety, um, being thoughtful, um, understand that everybody can't you know come out National Coming Out Day and be safe and have home and have shelter. Unfortunately, that's not the world we live in, and hope. But I think our work, where we try to have conversations like this, help people process the fear, the anxiety. Parents process the fear and anxiety and the stigmatizing attitudes um, can we've seen many times lead to not only better health outcomes for themselves, but also for their children and the people they're supporting. Um, honestly, if y'all haven't, if y'all don't know about Beam, check out their website, check out all their stuff. And you have a lot of free resources. Like seriously, like you provide the access to folks who may not, you know, kind of dipping their toe into talking about mental health. You're also addressing the stigma of mental health. Um, and for black folks, like we we don't talk we may talk about having the blues or maybe having a bad day but we don't talk about depression we don't talk about anxiety talk about schizophrenia we don't talk about all the other mental illnesses that are happening in our community um can you can we talk about why folks why there's so much stigma in our community like what are your what are your thoughts on that like, yeah that's a great question well you know one thing that i like to reframe is that i do believe that we do talk about uh you know schizophrenia and bipolar and depression I just think we have different language, which you just adequately kind of laid out there, right? So we don't call it the ways in which the Western diagnoses, but we do talk about those things, like when we see them. Like, so even the blues or, you know, like when I was growing up in the South, people would say, I have nerves, right? And nerves was a way people were speaking to anxiety, right? They may not use that same language, but they were still talking about how their nerves impacted their choices and their decision-making and how other folks around them were moving. And so I think we have this history in all, I think, um, communities have always had a history of talking about experiences we have in our body, experiences we have with how we cognitively process the world. We just haven't had the language of, uh, you know, the, the medical industrial complex in the United States, which is like, you know, historically has not been accessible to us. So of course we wouldn't have that language, right? And so um, just holding that piece, to speak to your question about stigma, about wellness, or about mental health, um, I don't believe that Black communities or Latinx communities or other communities have more mental health stigma. Um, I, I believe that um, we have, we have um, often 
less resources because we are a part of exploited communities that have been underpaid, that have been working check to check in ways that are uh, very distressing. And so there's a ways in which in some of our communities, we've just had to normalize a certain dimension of distress because we've never had access to the care that we need to feel differently, right? And so I think that like some of that stigma comes out of that, the, the broader American stigma, but it also comes out of the historical realities of mental health in this country. That like for most black people in this country, a lot of black people, I would say, there's not a distinguishing factor between the prison industrial complex and the mental health industrial complex, right? I think, Ashley, I've talked to you about how traveling across the country doing workshops on mental health, I ask our folks, hey, what comes up for you when you hear that term? And people immediately come back to responses where I, I hear, I think about, or I hear when my cousin got you know, taken away by a social worker or my friend who was having an episode and they went to jail and now they're just in the jail system because there's no, they're not getting treatment, right? So that stigma is rooted in the real experiences of black and brown folks every day with this intersection with the police and the, per, and the prison industrial complex and the mental health industrial complex are connected like this. Right, I mean, that's real as you're talking about folks who may have been having an episode and they are immediately sent to prison because they don't have a social worker or this, they're just not thinking about the mental well-being of the person. Um, and so we're afraid to even ask for help. Like, I think that's a big issue too, right? Because we we a cousin who got put away um, or someone who got put on meds and they're no longer their full self or didn't get on meds and like now they're homeless. Like whatever it is, like there's all these, all these other factors. I also wanted to, so like you are a person that is also very Zen but don't try you. Like, I also know that you're like, I'm not the one, like <laughs> I am not the one. And I wanna know, how do you have those uncomfortable conversations about racism and inequality? Like, what's your approach? Well, I wanna, can I, if I can, can I go to this question, this thing about Zen, can I talk about that for a minute? Yeah, I really sure. talk about that. And then I really wanna address this question too, as well, the racism question. You know, one of my good friends, um, Shani Nicholas, told me a long time ago, like right before the pandemic, she said, as your life gets bigger, so do your care practices have to become bigger. Hmm. And for me, that was a really big revelatory statement for me because it made me, because um, Beam was getting big, but my care practices weren't as strong. And so when people kind of say, oh, you're able to show up this way, I don't wake up like this. This is the result of really intentional and thoughtful about how do I build my life in a way that centers my wellness. So I always tell people there are a couple of things that we can do that aren't, um, that are more accessible for many of us, right? Starting a, a, a ritual in your morning. Like I, I set my morning with an intention, with a sound bowl. You know, sometimes I'll pull a tarot card. I'll make sure I meditate and say a prayer for what I want to focus and call into my day. Take some deep breaths. Not just rushing to the phone, not just rushing out to the world, right? Doing that. Making sure that I'm regulating myself, but also my food intake, right? Food, like one of the things that um, anybody who's ever worked with folks who are navigating um, mental conditions will tell you that like one of the things they say is regulating your meals and when you eat helps your emotional body, right? So are you eating lunch consistently at a certain time, breakfast, dinner, if you're not drinking water, right? Also how I close my evening, how I really try to be thoughtful about what am I grateful for? Not grateful to erase what I need to work on, but because I know how my mind works, that it can be very easy for me to just focus on the negative. So I have to have a practice where I know every day above my bed, it's like, what are you grateful for today? I'm like, oh, that's right. I gotta be grateful. So I didn't even thought about that because I'm focused on the negative, right? So building a life that has rituals and, and a process for you, whatever that looks like, whether it's coloring books, whether it's prayer, whether it's you read your Bible or your Quran, whatever you are doing, developing that to keep you regulated is critical. And the bigger your life is, the more practices you will need. I have a therapist, I have a coach, an executive coach, right? I have my friends who are my peer circle to talk about things. You can't close, if you close in on yourself as your life gets bigger, it gets harder and heavier. And so it's really important to make sure your care practices are thoughtful and intentional. Nothing, nothing is too small, build them for you, you know? I will say that. Um, the racism question or the sexism or the transphobia question, you know, I've been around and grateful for the teachers that have taught me since I've been around to see very clearly that like, um, we all have been deeply impacted by these systems of oppression and these ideas. We all have them showing up in our behaviors, ideas and choices in ways that sometimes we don't wanna be honest about. Um, and of course, it's, this is the equalize it because of course, if you're a white person expressing racism, it has a different impact than a black person who may express those same ideals. It's not to equalize it, but it is to acknowledge that we all are struggling with these things. And I think that a part of what helps me, even when it is uncomfortable, 
to navigate having conversations with people about the ways in which they've shown up is that I remember being that person who also didn't know, you know, and sometimes people don't know. And so when I see other folks doing similar things, now I'm not, I might be, I might be frustrated, but I also am like, I know you because I made, because I made peace with the fact that I was, I am still a student, but I've also been in that stage of my student life. So it gives me, it gives me some compassion, you know, for pe- particularly when it's not ill-intended, when it's unconscious, when it's like the behaviors and strategies, you're just like, do you know how that's showing up? Have you ever thought about that? You know what I mean? And understanding that the systems we live in do everything at, at, as much as they can to keep us, um, and perceptive to those things, you know. Facts. Facts. So basically you're saying you meet the people where they are and you show empathy and sympathy, but empathy, which I think is key, especially as we're all growing and learning, because um we should come to each other with compassion. That's how we grow. And, and I think we, we can't, and I think this is a piece too. Compassion doesn't mean that it's for me to take on right now. You know, somebody might have a question, I'm like, you know, I I get your question about this. I don't have the capacity or interest to do that. I don't consent to having that conversation. And that's okay because there are resources on the internet. There are other people to find to have those conversations. I think it's important to name it like, yeah, we want to have compassion. And sometimes we might feel like we want to disclose and share. And sometimes when we don't have it, when we don't have the interest, it's okay for us to say like, I'm not ready to discuss this. You need to find someone else to discuss this with. Or I don't have the space for this. That is okay. You mentioned one way you have your boundaries where you're saying, you know what, I don't have the space to talk about this. How else do you practice boundaries? I think that's important as you're talking about self-care and your mental health because you can't say yes to everything. Can't say yes to everything. You know, a part of my boundary practice is paying attention to what it feels like in my body when people ask certain things from me and trying to discern the difference for me, at least. Uh I'm trying to always discern the difference between my anxiety and my intuition, right? Um, and you're like, you know, like, so being attention to my body, like my, if my body gets really tight with the request someone makes of me, I'm always like, what is that about? Like, you know, is that because that is not really good for me or it doesn't feel flowy versus when some things happen and you feel excited and your body opens up, you're like, oh my God, I can't wait to do this. It's like, okay, wait, that's giving me a message. Both of yeah. those are messages, right? Or if I'm feeling flat, if I'm feeling disengaged, that's a message too. So I practice boundaries of myself by listening to what my body is saying and communicating that, you know what I mean? Like honoring that, like, cause the thing is we got to start boundaries with ourselves too. If we're not practicing honoring our boundaries, it don't, you know, how we, you know, it's going to, it's going to reverberate and impact in other ways. So that's one thing I do. I try to have um, clarity around my limitations and what my capacity at 41 years old, I have to know that like, this is enough for me. Like, you know what I mean? And like, understand that it will change. Like, as you get older, you'll be like, oh, I can go and do three events this weekend. Like, no, no, I got one event in me and I got a couch and some and some Kool-Aid and some Cheetos. That's all oh, I got. Yeah. In my- as I've gotten older, I'm like, I can't, the old girl can't do it like she used to. I feel you. It's funny. <laughs> so those are some things. Those are some ways. What advice would you give people who are struggling with their mental health or know someone who is? Like, if they're just kind of listening to the first time, you're like, you know what, maybe I need help. What, what advice do you give them? The first piece is to let you know that you are not the first, nor shall you be the last person to navigate those kinds of challenges. You know, I think for me, that was really important as a survivor of suicide, to be in community with other folks who also struggled with those um, thoughts, who struggled with wanting to be here, struggled with the pain. Like, you know, I always say for me, it was not, I, it took me a while to long, to realize that I wanted the pain to stop but I wasn't able to distinguish the pain from being here, right? And so when I was able to recognize it was, I want the pain to stop, I was able to really kind of uh, get care, get support to stop the pain and address the pain, whether the pain was the actual like um, physiological symptoms, the emotional way I was talking to myself, all those different things, that was really critical. So I think it's just important to know that you're not alone, that other people have experienced this and there are resources to help you find other people who experienced this. So you can see that um, that journey has been shared by many people um, in many spaces, right? That is one thing I would definitely share with folks. And also letting folks know that like, um, we are not robots and androids. We are humans and we are impacted by things. There is no shame in being impacted by things. I want more of us to have the correct, the comfort to be able to say, I'm not going to be ashamed about my fear, my sadness, or my frustration. We don't have allowed that because the culture deeply teaches us to be projecting vulnerability, to project I got it all together, and that anybody who doesn't project they have it all together is now suspect or less than. I think moving our culture towards you, wherever you feel, there is something to learn here and honoring that. And 
know what I mean? I want, I want folks to know that. I would also say for everybody, find out before a mental health crisis, find out today what are the resources in your local community. And maybe the, and the national resources too. Find out the people who are trusted, the social workers, the therapists, the healers, whoever they are, find those folks and be able to have them on dial and know what goes on to get there so that before the crisis happens, you are prepared to support your folks, right? Um, so much of crisis management, unfortunately, if we're not prepared sometimes, creates even more distress and dysregulation, right? So I think that's one thing I would say to all of our folks, plan ahead, map it out, have those, know those folks you trust in those systems and those places, you know? That's really, really good advice. And um, I appreciate your uh, vulnerability. And I mean, not that I, I'm surprised to give it to you, Yolo, but um, being honest about knowing how dark it can get, right? Like, I don't think enough of us are talking that, um, but knowing that there is one light at the end of the tunnel and two, there are places and people that can help you um, and support you through all this is, is, is really important and really big, and including BEAM. Um, but I just, I feel every time I say this, I feel so um, like relaxed. Like it's, it's interesting. Like you're talking to you as like a, like a glass of wine. <laughs> you kind of slowly start talking about it and then you're like, oh my gosh, yellow. Like you just feel vulnerable and safe. And um, I appreciate you curating that for other people because it's important. Yolo, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been such a insightful conversation, very vulnerable and also so honest and candid. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And for those who are interested in Beam, check out beam.community to learn more about Yolo and the amazing work that his organization is doing. Also check out some of his books. Uh, we'll make links below because he's also an amazing author. Um, thank you so much, Yolo. Thank you so much, Ashley. I appreciate you. And I appreciate all the work you do for health equity and our folks. Like it really means a lot to me. And um, just thank you. Oh, I'm like heart emoji. <laughs> heart emoji YOLO. I really appreciate you.